Preston, come on up here. Let's get with it here. This is Preston Files. Super excited. Preston um, is a part of our, uh, him and his family. He's been a part of our, our community for quite a while. Catherine and his wife, Elijah, Greta, and Madeline, we're all here cheering you on the first service. Um, but uh, excited for you. Preston teaches with uh, Brian Reagan, one of our elders, down at our, our, the Forge, which is our Mid-Valley study on Friday mornings. And um, boy, I'm just excited for this message. He also leads a, uh, a 51 c called Not So Boring Bible. You hear a little bit about it. It's online. Mm-hmm. Um, really great stuff. Uh, you can check that out online. But um, with that said, man, let me just pray. Father, thank you for my brother. Thank you for this word and just for his gifting and creativity here. I pray that you give us ears to hear, hearts to receive this morning, uh, this wonderful message. Lord, we just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, and thank you, Steve. This is an incredible opportunity. Um, I can't believe I get to stand up here and share with you guys. Um, who here celebrated an awesome birthday party yesterday? Yeah. Show of hands, like super fun. I mean, the festivities, the presents. I mean, we gather together with family and friends, ignore the poor, and give ourselves more stuff to open up. Yeah. I mean, if Jesus came back, he'd be like, you did what for my birthday party? We'd be like, no, 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 no. Like, we, we, we wanted this stuff, and so we, like, give each other presents. And Jesus would be like, you mean, like, encouragement or, like, things that you need? And we'd be like, no, 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 it's stuff that we wanted to replace the stuff that we already have. He'd be like, let me get my whip. I mean, he, it would be, like, shocking when we have this idea. The tradition is great. But Jesus would be like, who, who told you when my birthday was? And we'd be like, December 25th, like it's in the Bible or something. I don't know. We, we all do it. And it's like nowhere in the Bible. It's like, we, it doesn't tell us the day. It doesn't tell us the month. And it doesn't tell us the season. I mean, we had shepherds in the field at night. And then we kind of have this tradition. And I'm not saying like we need to cancel Christmas, but, but I, there's some great things. But I think we just need to come back to the idea that like, is this for Jesus? Or like, what are we doing? I don't know, like, I don't know why Steve didn't let me preach at, like, the Christmas Eve services. Like, I, I was ready, but here's the guy who hates Christmas. I love Christmas. Well, it's, it's a reason for this season. We'd be like, Jesus, we're celebrating your birth. Um, let's see here. Let's get my slides going here. Now I'm warmed up. Okay, here we go. Um, my, my message this morning is titled, The One Gift Left Off Everyone's Christmas List You Can't Live Without. And if you're saying, boy, that's a terrible title for a sermon, who let this guy preach? He's probably never done it a day in your life. You are correct. (laughs) See, I'm I'm an internet guy. Like, I do graphic design and website stuff. And, like, I know we record the thing and put it out on YouTube. And then, like, there's a newsletter that comes out that's like a little image that's like, click on this for this week's sermon. And so, like, what we're going to do is we're going to, like, make the font, like, a little bit cooler and then we're going to add, like, shock face Santa. Like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you forgot about this gift. And we'll add, like, a scroll emoji off to the side and then, like, some crazy arrows pointing to this stuff. And then, boom, hit them with that fire. <laughs> so it's going to get a lot of clicks. Like, I think it'll work, Steve. This, I know you don't do this, but I think, I think people will click on it. So it'll be great. We'll see how it goes. Um, what is the greatest gift? So this December, Steve's uh, let these young, amazing people preach. And the first of December, we had Cameron. Cameron came and spoke about how all have fallen short. This idea of sin, like nobody's like, well, I'm kind of good. Like I'm not murdering a bunch of people. Like I'm okay. And it's like, no, sin is all. Like all means all in the Bible. So all have fallen short. And so he preached out of Romans 3. And then we had Lee come and talk about how grace is the champion. And that even though all have fallen short, We get this gift of grace. The scales aren't even like, eh, like God's grace wins in a landslide. So he spoke out of Romans 5. And then we had last week, we had Trinity come and share the good news, the gospel message. They're like, believe in Jesus, repent and be saved. Like who who here doesn't want to hear more good news? Like, I mean, we should be sharing our testimony and like this gospel of Jesus, sharing that as much as possible. He was in Ephesians 2 and Romans 10. And now I get to come in here on this Romans road to salvation. Um, and they brought in the guy who loves the weird stuff in the Bible to talk about weirdo Bible time. Um, so I'm super excited. It's my favorite stuff to talk about. Um, so what is the greatest gift? 
And so here's, here's some options. Um, we have God's love. But is that like more like a Valentine? Like it's this cute card, like that's so nice that he loves me. Or, or like it's the greatest gift, Jesus' sacrifice. That this guy actually came and lived and died for us as a, as a perfect sacrifice so that we could spend forever with him. Or is the greatest gift this new spirit, this promise that like I had a stone of heart. I mean, I, I had a heart of stone and that God has replaced that with his spirit. I mean, read, read Ezekiel, the promises of the restoration of his people. Like, is that the greatest gift? And in this, you get to see the Trinity. Like, is it, well, no, I have to pick. It's like, is it, is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it the spirit? Like, is it all of them? Like, I'm getting confused. All right, so Romans 8. You, however, are not in this flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. I mean, this is a lot. Like if we were picking Bible verses to remember, this one's near the bottom. I mean, this is a bunch of stuff. And my favorite commentary on this, Paul is writing Romans, is from another guy who wrote the Bible. In 2 Peter, Peter says of Paul's writings, he says, yeah, some of the stuff the guy writes about is difficult to understand. And I'm like, yeah. And so what's, why, why write it like this? Why is Paul doing this kind of ninja spirit stuff? So like, yeah, like the flesh, you're not in the flesh, but like if I get a paper cut right now, like I'll bleed out and die. Like I'm very much flesh, but like this idea of the spirit. So in the spirit, what does that mean? Like, is he talking about like the Holy Spirit or is that like my spirit? And then why mention something like the spirit of God dwelling in me? Is that separate? Is that now I got three spirits or like how is... And then he, he adds this last per, uh, sentence about the spirit of Christ. And so you have to wrestle with like, wait a minute, what, what kind of spirit thing are we talking about? And again, you're going to see the Trinity. And so as we walk through this, we're going to talk about the greatest gift. We're going to talk about the Trinity. And then I'm going to talk about even more gifts. But like, let's focus in on this last sentence. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Okay. So how important is it to belong to Christ? You see, we got this idea like, I know hell is hot. So like the Jesus thing sounds way better. Like I want to go with that guy doing that vacation instead of the, the other thing. And so like super important, but like if fire insurance Jesus is like why it's important, then like you're missing the fun of like why we're actually following this guy, like why we belong to this guy. Or if you're just trying to like weasel in the back. Okay, so let's look at this. When Jesus comes back, like this real reality that like Jesus was born and that's what we celebrated in the birth. And then Jesus is coming back. Like this is a real reality that we should have like so much hope and be so excited. I mean, the guy said he's coming back soon and it's been like 2000 years, but like he's coming back soon. And if we're spending eternity, like 2000 years is not gonna feel like that long, I don't think. But when Jesus comes back in Matthew 25, he says he's coming back in all his glory with all his angels. And like this nativity scene, this cute little picture that we have of like Mary and the little animals and we get to set it out as a little decoration. Like Jesus came in none of his glory. Like, I don't know if you guys have seen a birth like at a hospital, but it's like a mess and it like stinks. And like, we're talking about like a stable or like a cave, like wherever this, these animals were, and you have the savior of the world being born to this like, pick how old do you think Mary is? And then like, there's already animals. It already stinks. You've got this like, I'm going to wrap up this newborn baby in the manger, like where animals eat. Like, so the idea of that he's coming back in all his glory should like really excite us to see like the wonder of how this guy who created the universe came and was born like lower than anything we could even possibly imagine. So when he comes back, Jesus is talking about when the son of man returns, Matthew 25, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And I know some of you guys are like, well, I don't really identify as a sheep and I don't really identify as a goat. So like, where do you want me to go? And I think it's like real clear. It's like sheep over here, goats over here. And now I want, I want to talk to the goats. And you're like, I'm a goat, what I, what I do? 
Well, the thing about a goat is we all have this rebellious spirit. We all want to do our own thing. But like the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has already died and paid the price for us that we get to spend eternity with him. It's nothing that we have to do to earn this thing. And so like if you're a goat, the good news is there's still time. God in his patience is like, I'm waiting. Like, I don't know when he's coming back, but like there's time today to be a sheep. And so the, the sheep, you're like, yes. If you're in the sheep line, like I want to tell you something about the greatest gift. See, the thing about the greatest gift is it's only great if you use it. So like nobody opened up something yesterday and was like, I love it whoosh, like we'll never use it again. Like you get to use it. And so this idea of like God's love and Jesus' sacrifice and this new spirit, that's the greatest gift because we actually get to use it. So anybody in this sheep pile, you're only in there because of what Jesus did and this gift that we get to use because we believe in him. So let's look at the Trinity because if we're going to spend eternity with God, Let's try to figure out who this guy is, right? Like the thing is we all try to put God in this box and that's not a fault. Like our little brains can only handle so much and I can't get up here and explain God to you. Like it's going to melt our minds, but we have to try to understand it in some way. And we all have God in this box and that's okay because we're trying to understand, but I'm going to like, just give your box like a shake this morning. And so it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but when we talk about the creator of the universe, the guy who made everything, we have to understand that he's going to be bigger than what we can even imagine. And so we have like God the Father, and then Jesus the Son, and then the Holy Spirit's like Cousin Eddie. Like, wh why do we treat him as like this really weird extra like add-on thing? I mean, if it's three in one, then they're all doing the thing that complements the other in this mind-melting way we can't even comprehend. Okay, so here's a little activity for you to do. Like you can do it on a scratch piece of paper or just in your head. But like draw a circle. We're going to make a pie chart. And then like divide up the pie chart based on who you think is the most important. So like you could half it and be like, well, God's definitely 50% of this thing. And you could be like down the middle, like Jesus gets 25% and then... The Holy Spirit gets 25%. Or, or whatever you want to do, like how are you comfortable saying who's in charge in this thing? And, and I would argue if you did anything other than just draw your circle and write all three in there, then you're missing like how the Trinity works and how they complement each other and the beauty of how this God that we worship like is made. Okay, so one of these might sound more uncomfortable than the other, but who's in charge? See, we, we say God is Lord. We say like Jesus is Lord. And the Holy Spirit is Lord. Like we have this, this God like on his throne in Revelation. And like, I don't know what you guys are picturing, but like the throne I've got in my head is like huge, like cartoon size. Like when the big foot comes down, like this is a big throne. Like it's going to be amazing. But then we have like, Jesus is at the right hand of the throne. So like we're comfortable with, we got seats, like it's musical chairs and we got God on the throne and we got Jesus down here. But then like, but there's no like little footstool for the Holy Spirit. Or, like where's the Holy Spirit sitting? If he's like on the throne, like it's really easy to put like a crown on God's head as Lord. It's really easy to like put a crown on Jesus. But like, what's the spirit like gonna like, Casper the ghost has like a crown on his head or like, well, I don't even know where he is. So we treat him like different. But in this idea of God being Lord, it's all of them. So I'll hit you with this. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. See, that in Christ, God's people are free. There is freedom in Christ. And this is something we get to like marvel at and just sit in. Because it's an unbelievable reality. All right, let's talk about the Trinity and like how this thing's actually like trying to work here. Again, with our, as much as we can understand. So God sent Jesus, like super easy. We got that. We did the thing yesterday. Like, yay, Jesus was born. Like, that's wonderful. We get that. 
And then Jesus sends the Spirit. See, Jesus said, it's better that I go. And if I go, I'll send the advocate, the helper, to you. But then, like, what's the Spirit doing? The Spirit's like, well, I'm done. Like, the Spirit is sending God. You see, so the Spirit is in the business of making a place where God can dwell. And this is, like, from the beginning of the Bible. I mean, if, if you read this thing cover to cover, you have the Spirit is doing work, like, on the first paragraph. Like, God created the heavens and the earth. And guess what the Spirit's doing? Like, like hovering over the water. And then like, spoiler alert, the Spirit's at the, in the last paragraph of the Bible. And so the Spirit's been at work this whole time, but he's in the business of making a place where God can dwell. And this is the promise throughout the whole Bible, where God wants to dwell with his people, that he actually wants a relationship with you. He created you, he knew you, and he's like, let's hang out. And you're like, what? But like, remember the garden? And God wants to go on like a walk in the cool of the day. Like how amazing would it be to go on a walk with God? He's like, I made that flower. I made that flower. Do you want to know about that flower? Like it would be unbelievable that we like even get to spend time with this guy. Okay, so as this works, there's something like really weird. Like we don't, when we grow up, there's a lot of like things in the church and we just kind of say like, go with it. Like if we think too hard about it, like, well, I don't know, it might get like weird. There might be like some uncomfortable questions. But like all three of these can like, like grieve, like feel sadness. Like what? So, so like God, if you've read the story of like Noah, like God has made mankind and like their, their hearts are evil and, and it grieves God. You're like, guy's sad. And then Jesus like has his friend Lazarus die. And like he goes and he weeps. Jesus is weep and like Jesus, like you know you're about to do the thing and Lazarus is gonna come out and like it's gonna be great. Like, why is he weeping? And then in, in Ephesians 4, Paul says, like, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What? Like, how do you how is the spirit like having an emotional? So there's something that they can all do in this weird way. And then think of like the promise in Revelation, like new heaven and new earth. And there will be no more pain and sadness and grieving. So like God's going to like, God can't wait for that too. Like this would be amazing. And then like, we don't even ask like the really weird questions, stuff like, can, can you kill God? Okay. So like if, if, if you're in the enemy's camp, like they've got to have been planning and like, how do we kill this guy? Like, can you kill God? And then like, well, why did God send Jesus? So Jesus died, like that is part of our Christian core, that this guy's perfect sacrifice, that he lived and died. But like, Jesus was God. But like, why didn't God send the Holy Spirit? Like, can you, like, can you kill a ghost? Like, how are you going to do that? But like, the, the Spirit can do things that the others can't too. So like, why did Jesus say, it's better that I go? And if I go, I'll send the Spirit. Like, why don't you just do it? Like, how is Jesus going to like, come inside my heart? Like, I mean, if he's like a dude, like, what are we going to like chest bump? And then he's going to be like, boom. Like, so the spirit can do things that like the others can't. And like, how does the spirit come inside me and dwell? Like, I don't know if you guys have read like Exodus 19, but like God on Sinai, God's presence is next level. I mean, you have Sinai like on smoking and there's like fire and lightning and thunder. And the people are like, uh, Moses, you go up on the mountain. Like God's presence is unbelievable. So like this idea of how they all work and they're different and yet they're complimenting each other and not doing something on their own. And you're like, I mean, this fits together like a little bit too perfectly. Like everything's like, you got an excuse for everything. But if we worship a perfect God, of course it's going to be perfect. Like it's like unbelievable how it works. And so the spirit at work, like from the beginning of the Bible to the end, when is the first time that God says, I'm going to put my spirit in this person? Like Bible trivia, my favorite thing. So like in Genesis, Joseph, this guy is interpreting dreams and has like crazy knowledge. And Pharaoh is like, I mean, show me somebody else. This guy has obviously got the spirit of God in him. But that's not the first time God says, I'm going to put my spirit in that person. And so the spirit's at work, but I think it's important if we're actually like reading it, like why highlight that? 
Okay, you guys ready for this? The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. You're like, what? I mean, like, I love the idea of eternity and that we're going to get to spend time with these characters in the Bible. And we're going to be like, whoa, Adam and Eve, that's crazy. I want to know everything about what was going on in the garden. And you're going to be like, Noah, holy cow, dude, you brought all those animals on the boat. And like, how many dinosaurs were in there with you? And like, what was going on? And you're going to be like, Moses, oh my goodness, dude, you parted the Red Sea. And like, what could you do? They're like fish flying out of there, like whatever. And then you're going to be like, Bezalel, hey, buddy. <laughs> and Moses is going to be like, it's Bezalel. Like, didn't you, didn't you read the stuff I wrote about the guy who did the, it's Bezalel. And you're like, what? I didn't even I didn't read. So, so what did Bezalel make, this master craftsman? God put his spirit in him and he makes the tabernacle, this place where God was going to dwell with his people. And Bezalel makes the Ark of the Covenant, which I don't know if you've seen like Indiana Jones or something, but the Ark is unbelievable. And like the presence in there and you take it into battle and it's like melting faces, like it was unbelievable. And Bezalel made this stuff. And you're just like, that's incredible. So let's look at another time the spirit was at work. And this, we just celebrated the Christmas story. Mary is hearing this from an angel. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you the power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. I mean, this is Emmanuel, like God with us. Like the Holy Spirit is making a place where God can dwell among his people. And like, I know like the Spirit is weird, like the Holy Spirit, like I don't know what the Holy Spirit can do, but like I'm a little freaked out. Like this would be an incredibly difficult pregnancy to explain. Like, I mean, pick how old you think Mary is listening to this. Like, is she 21? Is she 17? Is she 14? And she's like, she goes to her boyfriend and she's like, I'm pregnant. And he's like, pregnant with like emotion? What are you talking about? Like, we're engaged. And, and she's like, no, 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 no. Like, the Holy Spirit is doing this. And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm done. Like, I got to get out of here. Like, this girl is talking crazy. And so he makes a plan, like, I'm going to do this a little quietly because I'm like, I'm upright. But, but only in a dream does an angel tell Joseph, like, no, 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 things legit, like Holy Spirit's doing Holy Spirit stuff. And then he sticks around. And it's like, we just read the Bible like these aren't real characters or like these aren't real stories. And then we're like scared of what the Spirit might do in our life when the Spirit's been doing unbelievable stuff if you just read the story. And so let's look at what the Spirit's doing now. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you. See, the Spirit is making a place where God can dwell. And this is from the beginning of the Bible. God has a plan where he wants to dwell with his people. And so you had like Bezalel making this tabernacle. And then you have like this temple. Well, the temple doesn't work out. And then we give like the second temple. And then Jesus comes on the scene. And he's like, destroy that temple and I'll build it back in three days. And you're like, I'm a builder and that doesn't happen. But he's talking about his body. And then, like, do you not know that you are God's temple, where God's spirit dwells in you? And you're like, I don't know about that. That's making me a little uncomfortable. Okay, who here just had a panic attack at seeing one of these? Like, <laughs> software update, like, close, 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 like, throw your phone out of the car. It's like, like, this is super scary. Like, delay as long as possible. Like, I have to plug my phone in and then, like, leave it, and I can't use it for, like, five minutes, and then like everything's going to be like rearranged, and I'm going to have to relearn where the stuff was. Like we hate this. Like it makes us super uncomfortable. We have to pause and stop doing what we're doing so this thing does its thing. But like this is how the Holy Spirit works in our life. Like the, the software update changes our operating system. And our operating system is how we process information, how we make decisions in the world around us. 
And, and it gets uncomfortable. But there's not this hostile takeover where the spirit's like, I'm driving now. See, we have to like lean into this software update where we have to say like, I trust it. I'm going to listen. See, like you might even have like two different ways where you're going to try to get to your meeting or to your car. And like, how many of us like pause and be like, Holy Spirit, which way should I go? Like this kind of interaction, like where we're letting the spirit lead and that we're in step with the spirit. It's this new way to operate where we're still in this world, but like there's a partnership that God wanted from the beginning of the Bible. Okay, so I want to tell you about uh, this time I had a software update. So I've been a Christian, but then I kind of made a choice like, well, I guess I should start doing the things instead of like actually just listening and picking and choosing. So I was like trying to be a good Christian and then like going to Bible study and leaning into like community groups. And then I wish I could explain like this more clearly. It would be easier to talk about like me being struck by lightning. But like this is the summer of 2019. I I can't tell you the exact day or what happened, but the Bible became amazing. Like I I can't even explain to you. Like I wanted to know everything about it. Like all the stories in it, I wanted to read like all the commentaries, everything that seemed like a contradiction. I wanted like, I could not get enough. And you're talking to a guy who hates to read. Like I've probably read like 10 books in my entire life. And that's like including the Harry Potter series. (laughs) So it was like radical. And then the Bible project is like this unbelievable resource where they do like YouTube videos and stuff. And I was like, I can, I can read the Bible. And it's like, an, it just became unbelievable. And so the way I learn, I kind of like, like quick tidbits, like short information, give me 30 seconds, and then I'm interested. And then the next thing, I'm on Wikipedia for the, the next hour, like Googling the thing, looking it up. But I, I downloaded like as many Bible trivia apps as I could. I probably got like five or six. And in, in an hour, I was bored with all of them. I mean, they're kind of like repeating questions. Some of the questions were like, well, that's not fun. And then like, they didn't look cool. And, and I do graphic design and build websites. I like, I make apps. And, I, and, I, and here the Bible is unbelievable. And, and I have all the tools to make this thing. And then somehow I form a 501c3, and now I'm like the executive director of a Christian nonprofit. And it's like, what? Like when you have hindsight and look back, you're just like, all that because I updated, like, I, I checked the box, like, a spirit you lead. And it's, like, unbelievable. So free gift for Christmas. There's a card in front of you, um, but not so boring Bible. It's an app. It's a website. Um, and the mission of the nonprofit is to get people to read the Bible, to see the Bible as anything but boring. Um, and it's just a fun way to look at the Bible because we think about this, like, it's a super old book and it's, like, not fun. And it's, like, it's incredible. And so I'd like to read... John chapter 14, um, a couple verses in here. And then like, the, sadly, this is like a revelation to me. I can't remember when, but like the Bible wasn't written in English. <laughs> so like, I'm not going to learn like Hebrew and Greek. So like, well, I guess somebody else helped me out here. So like, which version of the Bible should you read? All of them. Like, why did they translate it to this word? And why did some word it this? And it's like the richness. It's incredible. Um, so let's read. This is John chapter 14. I'll read. Um, Your heart must not be troubled. You see, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he, it's, it's not going well. He's like, uh, you're going to betray me. You are going to deny me. And like, you can imagine the mood of the room is not like, This is an epic conversation. Your hearts must not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that you are where I am and you'll be with me. You know the way where I am going. I love this. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? It's like, we think like Jesus was talking all this stuff and then everybody got it. It's like super confusing to them back then. Like, where are you going? Like you, you tell us. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my father. 
From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I love this. Philip chimes in this time. Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough. I mean, Jesus just got done saying, like, look at me, I'm the Father. And then, like, what's Philip want? Like, no, FaceTime your dad. I want to see him. Like, what, what did he, like, how did he come up with this? Jesus again says, have I been among you all this time without your knowing me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? How's he doing that? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. And I won't spoil John 14, like, keep reading. It's incredible. Jesus is like, whatever you ask for in my name, I'll give it to you. And then he's like, and here's the advocate, like, here's the promise of the Holy Spirit. And you're like, what is going on here? But I want to I camp out on this last one. John 14, 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And you're like, well, that's a tough one. I know we've been talking about the Spirit, but yeah. But this or, why does he add or? Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. You see, if you're one of the disciples, you're like, you've seen the dude like walk on water and you saw your buddy walk on water with him before he started drowning. And then like you were at the wedding and you like saw water turn to wine. Like these are like next level, like category breakers. Like you've got no answers for like why these things are happening, but they saw some incredible stuff. So I I love this or because this is the same or we have today. Like we have these like matrix moments, like where everything we know breaks, like math doesn't explain it. Like science isn't helping us, but like we have to come up with like, what is going on? So like if I pray for something and then it happens and I have to like come up like, oh, this is coincidence. Or like if it doesn't happen, then the non-believer is like, well, this is why it didn't happen. The guy didn't. So both sides have to come up for a reason when we do these things. And then you're like, like, have I seen God? Like, I mean, you know, God says, no one can see my face and live. And then Moses like gets to see his back. But like, like, have I seen God? And it's like, no, but I mean, I can see you and I've seen me. And if we're made in the image of God, like, what am I looking at? And then like, have, have I heard God's voice? Like, Preston, like, that'd be incredible. Like from the skies open up and then I get to see like some sky writing or something. Like, like, have I heard God's voice? I'm like, not like that, but like somebody has said something to me when I'm wrestling with this other thing. And I'm like, How, when did, why did you say that when that thing applies exactly like it's supposed to? Like, is, that God's, is that God's voice? And I got to wrestle with like, these are matrix moments that, like wreck everything I'm trying to think about here. And then like next level, like when the spirit gets really interesting, like if you, have you ever heard tongues? Like I've had, like I've had people pray like tongues and like pray over me. And you're like, what? Like, this is not normal. Like I can't, it's a category breaker on every level. And then like, like words of knowledge. Like, how would you know that thing that you just told me? And like prophecy. Like if I've got a word for you, that's going to like change the trajectory of your, and you're like, when did you learn that? Or why are you telling me that? And like, there's all sorts of gifting that happens that we have to like come up with why this is happening. So I love the or. At least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Because we all have something that we're uncomfortable with that we can't explain that's going to radically change how we walk in the flesh now, but with the Spirit as our operating system. We walk by faith and not by sight. I mean, without faith, none of this is possible. Like, it'd be so easy if God was like, ta-da, I'm here. Like, and Jesus is coming back. It's going to be like incredible. And everybody's going to be like, oh yeah. Like every knee will bow. It's not going to be like, I wonder who that guy is riding a white horse. It's going to be obvious. But like without faith, we've got nothing now. We walk by faith and not by sight. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
So like, this is like how God is operating. And it's different than how we might do it. But God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so this is the kind of faith we need to walk in and believe in. So what happens if we don't believe? Like, no gifts, right? Like, I mean, if you don't believe, like, we get this. But like, wrestle with like, don't believe which part? Like, do you not believe that God loves you? Like, is that too hard? Like, I didn't get a candy gram, so I don't really know about this guy. Or like, like, do you not believe that Jesus died for you? Like, it was super long ago, and I don't know when that guy was born, and like, Snapchat, I can't verify his account. Like, we, we just have to go with this because it was a while ago. Or like, do you not believe that like there's a new spirit inside of you? Like, that's just too tough. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but if I get cut open, like a spirit's not gonna like fly out of me like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. Like, like it's tough. Like, I don't know how the spirit works, but this is what I know we are believing in as Christians, if we're gonna walk by faith and not by sight. So, what about these gifts? So, so like who opened up one gift yesterday and was like, this is amazing. I'm done. And left all the other gifts like under the tree. Like nobody would do that. Like if you saw gifts, like wrapping paper is like flying everywhere. And it's like, I'm going to open as many as I can. Like, I don't even care if I have to return this or take this back. I don't even like this, but it's just fun to get gifts. But like nobody left gifts under their tree yesterday. But like, why as Christians do we walk in the spirit, and they're like, ah, too weird. Like, the gifts of the spirit are abundant, and all we're supposed to do is ask, lean in, and update our software to be like, I want to operate in a different way now, because we can have this heaven on earth now, and yes, we've got the promise of eternity, and things will be different, but there's this wonderful way to operate in the spirit now, And so I don't even have time to unpack all these gifts, but it's like all of those would be like matrix moments that break everything you think in whatever kind of like category you are. If you're a doctor, if you're a scientist, if you're like studying the stars, like these things would break categories of what we can explain and know. So tons of gifts. Okay. Are we asking for those? And the Bible says like earnestly seek prophecy. Like, who is praying, like, that they get a word or something to, like, prophesy over, like, Aspen or the truth? Like, I don't want to stand up there. Like, that's going to look super weird, and I'm going to say something super weird, and then everybody's going to think I'm super weird. Like, but this is how we're supposed to operate. And then, like, the fruit of the Spirit. Like, all these gifts are unbelievable. Like, who wouldn't want to unwrap patience? Like, I need more patience, or I want, like, more joy in my life. But these are all gifts available to us that all we have to do is trust and believe and ask our good father that he will give us these things. Okay, so if you're like, those gifts are too weird, I don't know what you're talking about, I haven't opened any of those gifts. Like, let's look at the simple stuff. So like, how do you have breath? Like, how are you living right now? And you're like, well, air's free, I'm just doing it. And it's like, this is Aspen air, it's really nice. It's like, what, what is making you breathe right now? Like, how do you have life? And then like, how do you have time? Like, how are you living in this moment on earth now? Like, what kind of gift? I don't even know how many days are written in his book, but that we get one more is incredible. And then like talents, like, why are you good at what you're good at? Why do I have gifts that are different than yours? And like, how does that work where we can actually partner with God to do like amazing stuff now. And eternity is going to be amazing too, but we get to experience it now if we're actually walking in this. And so like, which one is the greatest gift? So like, is it God loves you? It is the greatest gift that Jesus died for you? Or is it the greatest gift that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? And the answer is, it's all of these. Like, that's why it's amazing. And so the one gift left off everyone's Christmas list you can't live without, it's God. And if you're like, oh man, I got that last year. It's more of God. <laughs> like, it's incredible. that This guy would like, he, we can't outgive this guy. This guy's got amazing stuff for us. And all we have to do is trust him 
and update our software, this operating system for how we walk around and interact with people on earth now. And then we have this unbelievable promise of eternity that's going to be next level amazing that just we can't even comprehend how amazing it'll be. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this opportunity um, to share, to talk about your word. I just thank you for this church, for the people here, um, that we get to be light, Lord. And for Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, for coming, for dying for us, for living a life that we get to live eternity with you because of what you've done. And Holy Spirit, move, work inside of us, come alive, help us, walk with us, that we can be in step with you and that we can trust you in a new way to operate, Lord. We ask these things in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Thank you. All right.